The first presidential debate is the biggest political spectacle of the election, traditionally with the biggest audience and potentially with the campaign changing moment. It may be the best chance for candidates to win over voters who haven't made up their mind and could decide the next president. Now, on this morning, after the debate, the big question is what those voters are thinking after 90 minutes of verbal brawling. Can it's, I be honest? It's a very important try question. Try to be honest. No, I, I stood good up. Thing. No, he stood I, up I, the answer to the question is no. Ukraine. No, I, sir. With a billion sir, dollars, if you don't get rid of the absolutely you know what, you're, wait, not wait, you're true. Tape you're doing it. You're going to have tape. true. Gentlemen. You could argue the only attempt at a civil exchange the whole night was at the very beginning when Donald Trump and Joe Biden walked out to their respective podiums. Ellen Morrow was watching. She's with us this morning in Washington. As I said, brawl, Ellen. I don't think we've ever seen anything like it in a presidential debate, at least as long as they've been televised. Lots to talk about. Let's begin with Donald Trump's performance. Well, Heather, Donald Trump essentially spent the whole debate trying to shout down uh, Joe Biden, constantly interrupting Joe Biden, who was really unable to even finish a sentence. To sum it up, it was basically absolute chaos on stage, and it went off the rails about as quickly as possible in the very first section uh, of the debate. Trump's strategy was clearly to attack, 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 interrupt, 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 and there was no, you know, real appealing to the middle here. This was Donald Trump doubling down on his base. One particular low light of the night when, uh, was when Trump refused to condemn white supremacists. Here's that exchange. Sure, Are you I'm prepared willing to, to do specifically that, do it? Well, I, go would ahead, say, I would say almost everything I see is from the left wing, not from the right so wing. So what, what, you you what are you saying? I'm, I'm willing to do anything. I want to see well, peace. Then do it, sir. Say I'm, it. Do it. Say it. Do you want to call him... What do you want to call them? Give me a name. Give me a white name. White supremacists and right like me to condemn? White proud supremacists boys. and right the proud boys. boys. Stand back and stand by. So stand back and stand by is not a condemnation of white supremacy. Donald Trump had several opportunities there to do that. The moderator, Chris Wallace, uh, pressuring him to do that, pressing him to do it. Joe Biden pressing him to do it. And Trump just wouldn't do it, Heather. And after that, the organization he mentioned, Proud Boys, which was founded by a Canadian, was celebrating the president's comments online. And that acrimonious tone you heard there was how it was for pretty much the whole night. Uh, Wallace tried to hushed President Trump multiple times, reminding him that his campaign had agreed to the rules to give Biden two minutes uninterrupted to answer questions. But uh, Wallace chiding the president really had no impact at all because those interruptions uh, continued. Another moment at the end of the night was when Trump repeated his claims without offering any substantial evidence that this election is going to be rigged. Here's what he said. I hope it's going to be a fair election. If it's a fair You're election, I am 100 percent on board. But if I see tens of thousands of ballots being manipulated, I can't go along with that. This is going to be a fraud like you've never seen. So stunning comments from a president of the United States. That was one of the very last things he chose to say to the American people last night. And think about it. Again, he's not offering any substantial or verified evidence for these claims. And this is the president saying this to tens of millions of Americans on primetime TV. The president seeding doubt in his own country's democratic process just five weeks before the election, clearly laying the ground groundwork to dispute the results if he loses. And think about the impact this will have on his supporters watching at home who believe everything the president says, Heather. If he loses, Ellen, Joe Biden right now leading in the national polls as a result facing a very different kind of test because he knew Trump would try to rattle him over the course of their face-to-face. Uh, -face. How did he fare? Well, Biden was visibly frustrated throughout the night, exasperated, because as I said, he really couldn't finish uh, a sentence. He sort of alternated between trying to interrupt Trump himself or just listening and kind of laughing at Donald Trump. But it wasn't really long into the debate before Biden told the president to shut up. Here's that part. The, the question Supreme is, Court justice, the radical question, left, will you who shut is up, your, man. Listen, who is on your list, Joe? This Who's is on your so right. Gentlemen, is, I think this we've is ended so this. He's going to pack the court. We have end, oh, no, no. Not give a list. We have ended this segment. We're going to move on to the second segment. That was really a pr productive segment, wasn't it? <laughs> Keep yapping, man. 
And that was the very first opening section of the debate, Heather. Biden also called Trump a liar and a racist and the worst president in American history. He also made an effort several times to skip Trump and speak directly to the American people at home, especially when talking about the pandemic, which has killed more than 200,000 Americans. Here's uh, uh, President, uh, John, sorry, Joe Biden speaking to the American people. You folks at home, how many of you got up this morning and had an empty chair at the kitchen table because someone died of COVID? How many of you were in a situation where you lost your mom or dad and you couldn't even speak to them? You had a nurse holding a phone up so you could, in fact, say goodbye. You would have lost far how more many people. people. And by the way, in terms of the, the whole notion of a vaccine, we're for a vaccine, but we, I don't trust him at all, nor do you. I know you don't. Now, the question is, where does this leave things when opinions are so entrenched here? It's hard to say. Uh, different polls are saying different things this morning. But what we can say for sure is that this was Donald Trump going all in on his base, Heather. And if you were an undecided voter last night who was somehow hoping for an actual conversation or debate, you would have left uh, your TV last night feeling very let down. Certainly, that's what we are seeing in polling this morning. Ellen, thank you very much. Ellen Morrow is in Washington. Ravi Perry is the chair of the political science department at Howard University in Washington, D.C. He was our guest yesterday, looking ahead to the debate. After what happened, we had to have you back. So, Professor, good morning once again. Good morning, Heather. I'm looking forward to your analysis, but I would like to begin. As an American citizen, as an American voter, how did you feel? watching that last night? Wow, you know, that I really appreciate that question. As an American, I really felt sad and a bit embarrassed, to be honest, that this was uh, what millions and millions of people had to see. You know, we know that presidential debates are kind of really the first time that the everyday kind of average Joe and Mary uh, chime in uh, and actually start paying attention and trying to figure out what's different between this candidate and that candidate. And last night was the chance for millions of Americans to get that information. The problem was that not much information was shared because there was so much combative divisiveness and interruptions, uh, you know, reminded me of arguments and, and uh, that I have uh, been privy to in all kinds of aspects of my life where people are just trying to one up each other, but no one's really getting a, a, a point out that allows people to learn more about them. And as much as uh, Vice President Biden tried, you know, unfortunately, President Trump was very effective at manipulating the time. And uh, so I think I think the poll you indicated at the outset is right, that a lot of people left that debate very, very frustrated. We will look to some specific examples of how both the candidates uh, handled things on stage. But the big question, if, as you suggest, so many are turning to the debates to figure out if it might determine their voting decision, we know there are such a small number of undecided voters, Professor. Will this debate change anything? Well, I think it will. You know, that's the ultimately uh, TV is kind of everything in American life and politics, particularly when the uh, current uh, head of the Republican Party is uh, as a former, of course, quote unquote, uh, you know, media reality TV star. And so so that that indicates that TV is a linchpin. It matters what people are, are hearing on TV and it matters the extent to which truth is being prevailed in TV or whether truth is being assailed against. And, and yesterday, it was very clear that President Trump was on the defensive and uh, would not even allow uh, former Vice President Biden to answer some of the questions uh, from uh, Chris Wallace there mm -hmm. at Fox News. And that really, you know, led to a sparring match that was less about uh, information, perhaps, that voters may have been looking for. So if he needs to win, if he needs to win senior suburban women and white college grads, which are his key demographics to go after, you're suggesting that they didn't get any substantial uh, information to help them to make that decision based on what he portrayed on stage. We're going to play a clip because his style was certainly on full display, Professor Perry, as he tried to dominate the stage. Here's an example. First you president vice... America has ha ever had. Hey, hey, Come Joe, on. Let, me, let me just tell you, Joe, I've done more in, in 47 months. I've done more than you've done in 47 years, Joe. We've... So lots of barbs and, and insults. Um, again, what does he accomplish with that style? 
Well, you know, the image for uh, the Trump administration and Trump campaign is that that type of bombast is strength. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what books on leadership he read to come to that conclusion, but that, in fact, is what uh, many of his talking points has indicated uh, that is what they believe. And so that M.O. Uh, has been what has been par for the course, no pun intended, for the heavy golf player uh, in Donald Trump. And, and that is something that he uh, put on full display last night. I, I'm just not so sure it helped him uh, in the effort to try to sway any additional voters in his direction. So, not winning those new voters he needs as he trails nationally by at least eight points is what the polls are showing us right now. All right, Joe Biden. Even Democrats were nervous about his potential performance last night, but the consensus seemed to be he proved he was with it uh, and withstood those blows. But did he go down to Trump's level? Here's an example of an exchange, and then we'll talk about Biden. I'm not going to answer the question Why because, you answer that because question? the you question is the question Supreme is Court justice, the radical question, left. Will you who shut is up, on, man? Listen, who is on your list, Joe? This is, will you shut up, man? There's a line that a lot of people are going to remember from that night. I just keep thinking about Michelle Obama. Will they go low? We go high. He didn't go high there. No, no. Uh, uh, Joe Biden tried his best, I think, to uh, bite his tongue, as as it were. And, you know, on national TV, we have tens of millions of people watching. I'm surprised that he didn't say more, given all of the barbs that was thrown in his direction. I mean, come on. President Trump insulted his son on national television, not only the one that he's lying about in terms of these so-called Ukrainian, uh, you know, million-dollar deals that have no basis of truth to them, but about his own deceased son who served in the military honorably, whether you like his politics or not, is irrelevant. And President Trump couldn't even bring himself to, uh, as the current sitting president, to say thank you for your service. Hmm. You know, that is something that I think uh, Joe Biden uh, was really hard pressed to try to calm down about uh, last night. And that clip you just showed was one of the many instances where I think he tried his best to, to remain some level of civility when you're standing against someone who's, uh, uh, whose message was not about content and detail and information and persuasion, but was about bombast and drama. He certainly did, though. He got in his own digs, too. Clown, fool, liar. He was equipped with some insults himself. Joe Biden was on the night. I want to ask you about what turned out to be one of the most significant moments of the debate. We knew there was going to be a discussion of race and racism in the United States. But here's part of a key exchange, Professor. I'm willing to, to do that, but do it. Well, I, go would ahead, say, I would say almost everything I see is from the left wing, not from the right so wing. So what, what, you you what are you saying? I'm, I'm willing to do anything. I want to see well, peace. Then do it, sir. Say I'm, it. Do it. Say it. Do you want to call him? What do you want to call him? Give me a name. Give me a white name. White supremacist and right like me to condemn? White proud proud supremacists boys. and right the proud, proud boys. boys. Stand back and stand by. But I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Somebody's got to do something about Antifa and the left, because this is not... So there, uh, one of the key moments as the president refused to denounce white supremacy, and actually that, what people are mulling over, the, the, um, the shout-out to the Proud Boys, this uh, Western hate group, as, as many people describe them, but, uh, you know, shouting out to them, energizing them, refusing to denounce white supremacy. And I'm just wondering what your reaction to that was and the impact that you think this will have. I wish you had uh, hours to talk about this at length, because this is one of the perils that has plagued American history, Western democracy, uh, since its inception. Uh, race is a, a hard, hard battle to uh, get folks in this side of the Atlantic to understand in ways uh, that would help all of us advance our futures better. As a black man, I wake up as a black man every single day in this world, the only world I've ever known. You know, I've been concerned about this presidency from the beginning because he was endorsed by the Ku Klux Klan, the official crusader newspaper of a terrorist organization that has, of course, sought to kill and maim people who look like me uh, since before the country was a country. And for him, this president, to come out and to not to be able to clearly and definitively and quickly and decisively say that racism and white supremacy have no place in 2020, 
Uh, this is really unacceptable. And it's not just, you know, a partisan barb and a complaint about someone's ideological point of view. This is a life and death matter. This is not okay. You may disagree with Donald Trump on certain issues, but it's certainly not at all okay that a president of the United States can say that tens of millions of its citizens are, are literally um, subjected to racism and subjugation and discrimination and disenfranchisement and, and 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 that that is something that apparently for him is not only okay but it's something to be cheering and be proud about. He told Proud Boys, which is a documented hate group, to stand back and stand by. It's now the number one trending uh, uh, issue on Twitter. He spoke live and national television, global TV last night to tens of millions of people. It wasn't a dog whistle for white supremacy. This was an actual conversation uh, that he said on national television, inviting them to stand back and stand by. Not saying, I disagree. Not saying, let's not you know, talk about this because we need to have a full conversation. And Chris Wallace, by the way, I have to say, from a journalist's point of view, did not do a very good job in pressing that issue. This was not a typical policy issue. This is at the core of who we are as a country. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we have a president is racist and this is a white supremacist, uh, the first overtly racist president since Barry Goldwater in 1964, presidential candidate. And, you know, this is someone, again, endorsed publicly by the Ku Klux Klan. He's equivocated on David Duke before. And this is a clear example uh, where he tried to do so uh, at Charlottesville, saying that there are good people on both sides. It's obvious that we not only have a president who is conservative and a Republican, but that he's a racist. And that is very, very sad for the United States of America. I really did want to hear from you on that. Thank you, Professor Perry. And for all of your assessment and analysis, really appreciate it again this morning. We'll speak again soon. Thank you, Heather.